What's going on everybody? Welcome back to another exciting head scratching episode of Insane Disappearances. Tonight is going to be a little different. I'm going to switch gears. I'm still going to be talking about the same topic with people who disappear in national parks, but since my channel has been, you know, you know, getting even better, you know, with subscriptions and, you know, everything else that's been happening with my channel, I want to kind of, you know, spread abroad and talk about other topics, you know, but still the insane the, the, the disappearance of national parks will be my main topic of all times. So don't you worry about that. But tonight I got a special guest tonight and he is going to be talking about his experiences, uh, namely uh, uh, his um, experiences with UFOs and a Bigfoot experience he had while he was hunting in the woods. And his name is uh, uh, Matthew. What's how do you pronounce your last name? Uh, it's pronounced Choder, spelled C H O D E R. Okay, yeah, we got a guy here named Matthew Choder, and he's got some very, very interesting stories to tell. And then I story the experiences. I want to make sure I get that clear. You know, stories and experiences are two different things. So, uh, right, all right, Matthew Choder. Uh, welcome to my channel, and I really appreciate you uh, wanting to talk about your experiences. And like I said before, I really wanted to, you know, sp you know, spread spread abroad and just talk about other different topics, you know. And from what you have told me when we last talked, is very very interesting. I definitely want everybody else to hear it. So uh, I just want to say welcome to my channel. So how you doing tonight? I'm doing real good. Thank you for having me. Um, I watch your channel a lot, and I like your videos, and um, I think you do a real good job at getting the awareness out there and you know letting everybody know what's going on. Oh, thank you very much, man. I appreciate that, and I, I can't do it without my fans and uh, or just without people who have these experiences. Cause this makes it even better when you have actual people coming forward with really strange experiences that most people would think is you know a story that just was told out of a book or something like that so exactly. okay so let's see here which one would you want to start with first you know like i know we talked about the ufo uh on the top of the mountain your niece's experience the bigfoot experience ghost experience so which one would you want to um you know talk about first because like i said you got the floor right now okay uh yeah we can start with um <clears throat> the top of the mountain uh ufo experience when i was a, a kid all right, perfect. Yeah, okay, well, you got the floor, my man. Yeah, that ain't. So, so, All right. Yeah. All right, well, yeah, um, I was uh, younger. I was about 12 or 13, and, uh, and my grandparents had a house. My uh, my father's parents had a house in uh, Fountain Hills, Arizona. And Fountain Hills is mostly, like, one big suburb, but there is a, a mountain there. It's called Red Mountain. It's a red clay mountain. That, it's kind of just is random. It's not really doesn't match the color of the rock to the other mountains around it. And so we had a really good view of it from the porch. And one night, me and my dad and my little brother were all out on the porch just kind of watching the stars and the mountains and everything. And from that porch, you have a really good view of Red Mountain and the top of it. And it's completely flat on top. It's like a, like a tabletop. Okay. And so we're sitting there looking at it. And after about, we were sitting there looking at it for about 15 minutes. And then after about 15 minutes, this like it, it was it was a disc but it was more of an oval and it stood up sideways like we took a round table and you stood it up sideways and it stood there for just a second and we all were watching it and it just shot off into the sky like just like you know they say like it super fast like it, it didn't make any noise or anything like that just shot off and I was got really excited you know and I said dad did you see that oh my god did you see that and he kind of was still staring at the mountain. He was like, yeah, yeah, I saw it. And it was probably some, you know, military plane or something. But he, later on, like, when I, I brought it up recently, about, actually about a month ago, when we were talking about it, because he was telling me, um, he lives down in Phoenix right now, and he was telling me he saw a UFO down there with him and his friend about a month ago. And then he brought up the, what happened when I was a kid and everything, and it just kind of, reassured me that you know even to this day I, I saw what I saw you know because there was other people there right yeah because that, that's the one thing I tell everybody on my on my channel that out of all the things that may lie to you which is mainly humans 
your eyes of all the, of all things would never lie to you. So if you saw something, you saw it. And the, the only thing that could separate you from that um, that thought is you doubting yourself. You know. So that, that's the one thing I always try to tell everyone: is don't don't ever doubt yourself. Don't let anyone tell you anything different. If you saw it, you saw it. If they don't believe it, you know that you saw it. So that's all that really counts. So like uh, now, when you saw the UFO, how far? Or how close would you say you were? And was it like uh, when you when you saw it? Was it really big from where you were standing, or was it from a distance where it still looked big, but it wasn't up close? I mean, how how would you explain it? Right, right. Okay, so um, I would say that there are houses. Thinking about it now, because I didn't really know how to measure man as a kid, but thinking about it now, their house was probably a a, a few miles from the mountain, okay. like literally. Okay. So. The top of the mountain, um, you could see it, like from, like I said, from their porch. And I, I, I would say I, I couldn't tell you how big the top of the mountain was lengthwise, but it was the length of the top of the mountain. Wow. That is yeah, deep. it was the whole length of the. And you know, like I said, it's like a kind of just a small mountain. It comes up and like has a little flat top on, like on the top of it. But it's, it was the whole length of it, and you know it. It is a, technically a little mountain in the eyes of, like, if you're comparing it to other mountain ranges in Arizona, but it is not a little mountain. You, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, you know, it, I would have to say it was pretty pretty darn big. Wow. Yeah, that, that, that definitely sounds huge. <laughs> yeah, because that, that, that reminds me of that this experience I had, I'd say, like, last week on my day off. Uh, it was either... Uh, Tuesday or Wednesday, where I could literally, I was literally looking up in the sky and I saw something that looked like it was being cloaked because I could saw, I could see the evidence in the very front. And from what people have said in the past about how big they are, a lot of people would, would compare the size of a UFO to the size of a football field. And the first one that I saw was like it had like <clears throat> it had like a flat surface in the front where it almost looked like like a, like it was squared. And the front end, it looked like like a cloud that never moved. You know, it was almost like they were using that as a cloaking device. And it just sat there the whole while I was standing outside, and it just it it literally never moved. And then minutes later, another UFO came up from behind it, but this was an actual disc, and I literally saw the grid, like like the frame of it on the very bottom, and that pretty much covered up half the sky over my over my house. You know, it wasn't directly over my house. It was like, like say, if I'm standing in front of my house, in front of me is my driveway, and then is the street, because I live in a cul-de-sac. So it was like right there in the center of the cul-de-sac, covering up half the whole sky. But it was so dark, I could literally see the shape of it because of the, the night sky. Because, like, you know, most of the time when you're looking at the night sky, it's not always pitch black. You can see, you know, the stars kind of illuminated a little bit to where you can see a tiny bit of blue, but like a navy blue color that still lights it up enough for you to see the frame of a UFO. I mean, I, don't, I guess that's a good way to explain it, but I did see the size and the shape of it. So I definitely know how you feel about that. And, and it was definitely massive. So that is yeah. one incredible experience you had there. Um, so other than that, is that the only one you had as far as seeing a UFO? Is it Does it get deeper as far as the experience? Uh, uh, oh, uh, yeah, not at all. They uh I've, in total, I've seen eight up to now from okay. the time I told you about until now, there it's eight. Okay. And they weren't all the same and they didn't all do the same thing, but right. they were all definitely UFOs because they just, you know, it's, you, you can look at something and know like that, that it's different, right. you know, like exactly. that's not from here. Like, okay. So for instance, like I, I was, I'm a landscaper, so I, you know, I was at work about, hmm, I would say, had to be six weeks ago now, but I was in, working in this yard, and I, you know, I, me and my partner's like on the side of the house, out of view and everything, and I, I was taking like a five minute break, and I was vaping, and I look up, and I'm looking at uh, Cheyenne Mountain, because I live in Colorado Springs. Right. I was looking at, the side of Cheyenne Mountain. We were probably less, maybe less than, like just less than a mile from the actual mountain slope, the starting of it. 
so like we were right there, you know. And there's these like uh, antennas on the top of the corner of the mountain. And they're like this big set of antennas. Like I don't know what kind they are, but they're huge, tall antenna towers. And right, like to the right of that, in the sort of the middle of the mountain, I was looking out there and I saw something sitting there because the clouds were moving pretty fast. And I was sitting there watching them, and there was this. At first, it looked like this little black dot, and it was just sitting there. And I thought maybe at first it could have been a gnat or something, like just kind of hovering there. So, you know, I kind of waved my hand like that, and it didn't move. And then I realized it was like there were clouds moving in front of it, and they would, you know, disappear behind the cloud, and then the cloud would move out of the way of it, and it would still be sitting there. So I, I I started getting you know excited. I was like, this this isn't normal. I was look, I was watching it for like a good five minutes. Right. So my partner comes around the house, and I was like, hey man, come over here for a minute. So he, he comes walking over. He's like, what? And I pointed. I was pointing at it, and I was like, do you see that? And he was like, looking for a minute. He's like, yeah. You talking about that little black dot or whatever? I was like, yeah, man. And I was like, it's just been sitting there for like five minutes, almost ten minutes now. And like we were watching it, and all of a sudden it just started going straight up like completely straight up not like super fast it just started moving straight up sort of like medium speed not slow not super fast just kind of cruising and then it stopped again when it got up like above the clouds and then all of a sudden it dropped really fast like got all the way right before it was going to touch the mountain it stopped again and then all of a sudden it just bloop, and it was gone just like that almost like uh, almost like you know um, it like something got covered in front of it or it just literally like turned invisible or just like shot off at light speed. I have no idea, but it was gone. And he he even said, and and like, he's not a super skeptical person or anything, but he he's pretty skeptical about a lot of things. And he even said, you know, he was like standing there looking at it. He was like, it's gone. And I was like, I know. And, I, and he was like, no man, it's gone. Like, did you see that? I've never seen anything like that in my life. I was like, dude, I have, you know, I was just like, I, you know, I've been trying to tell you, because like, we'll have discussions about, you know, UFOs and aliens and stuff sometimes, and he was pretty skeptical about it, but he, he, he's, to this day, he still has been talking about it at work almost like every day, he mentioned something about it to me, and yeah. like, it really, it shook him, you know what I mean, like, it didn't, not in the sense where it like, made him scared, but he, it, I think it changed something in him, like, he finally got, you know, he got to see what he's been looking for, just like I had. And, but I, it wasn't as intense for me because I've seen them before. Right. But, it, but like I said, they, they're all different and they all do different things. And that, but that was just, you know, it was, it was almost like it was putting on a show, you know, not for us, just, you know, yeah. put, doing something. <laughs> but it was, it was one of the most incredible things I've ever seen. Right, yeah, and believe you me, I know that for a fact because it has happened to me numerous times where it's like, they know you want to see something, so they do a lot of these weird elliptical like uh, movements in order for you to just know that it's it's, it's actually there. Because like, even for me, even if I did I did see so like I one 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 night I was looking through my telescope and I got one of them high power ones so I could see pretty you know far out. I was actually looking at the Orion's constellation and there was this white dot. They looked like it was pretty far out there. I mean I don't. I wouldn't say that it was actually near the Orion's constellation. I would never be able to see it from that distance. So it was obviously probably at the very top of the atmosphere because it was pretty high up. And it was making all these crazy movements. Like it would dart mm -hmm. down in a curve and then it would shoot back up in like a figure eight. And it, would just, it was just making all these fast and slow movements. Like it would shoot over here at high speed and curve up real slow and just making all these crazy patterns and I'm looking at it through my telescope so it, it's almost like they know that you want to see something you know because I have heard that they can read your thoughts almost from that high up because like say if you using a camcorder I've heard that they will literally stop while you're recording and then as soon as you you know put the recorder down that's when they start moving so it's like they either they're playing with you you know, by not doing anything, and then as soon as you stop recording, that's when they start moving. So yeah, that I can. That is definitely something that I could call a UFO experience because it has happened to me numerous times. You know, and because when I saw one hovering underneath the moon when I was going to my mother's house, I could see it go up at a I'd say a 
two o'clock angle and shoot off out of the atmosphere and I saw a streak of light shooting away into deep space. So, yeah, I understand where you're coming from. <laughs> I have been there. Whew, wow, that, that's, that's amazing. It's, it's actually um, funny you say that about it being under the moon because two of them that I've seen have been in front of the moon. Oh, that's even better. <laughs> wow. Yeah. <clears throat> like, the first one, I, the first one actually happened, um, I don't, it was a, I was watching a lunar eclipse and like I lived in a, an apartment complex and I can't remember exactly what year it was. Uh, I'm trying to remember, but uh, we were all watching this lunar eclipse and it was cool and everything and I was out there like almost all night. It, you know, it eclipsed and then it went back and everything. And then, so I got tired and went to sleep. So the next night I was out there again looking at it and at first I thought it was kind of like what I was telling you about the cloud you know, so like it was kind of just sitting there, it was like a black dot almost. And then it just started doing like a square, like a sort of like a square movement. Like it would go up and then to the left, down to the right. And it was doing that. And uh, my mom came outside to smoke a cigarette. And I, like as soon as she came outside, I looked up and it was gone. And I was like, Mom, I just saw this thing up there. And I was like, Tell her about it. And, like, as I'm telling her about it, she looked up and was like, is that what you're talking about? And this time, it was closer. Like, not <laughs> super close to our apartment building, but it was definitely way closer than it was before. Like, right. if you look, ever looked up and see, like, an airplane, like a 747 at night fly over the moon, mm -hmm. kind of how that looks. That's how far away it was at first. And now, it's, like, way closer. Like, I don't, you know, not super close to us, but sort of in the middle. And, right. But I saw it though, and, but it was, that's the weird thing, it was dark outside, but like, this thing was darker, it was like a solid, pitch black, almost like an egg, and it was right. egg shaped, and it, but more rounded, and like, it was, it was, you know, it was just like sitting there, and me and my mom were both looking at it, so she goes in to get my brother, and you know, she's like, you know, keep your eye on, I want to get my brother, and then show him. So she runs in the house to get my brother. I'm looking at it, and like as I'm watching it, all of a sudden, this little blue light, like a faint blue light, not super bright, but a faint blue light, just sort of shined for a second and then went away. But it came out of like the center of the front, like that I was looking at. It was this little blue light. It was like came open for about I don't know three, four seconds, and went in and went back down. And like it, I was just standing there in a, like in awe. I couldn't. Like, I couldn't even move. I was just, I did not want to take my eyes off of it. You know, because, like, when you see them, it's not for too long. So I wanted to, you know, make sure I get a detailed, you know, picture. And I'm watching it, and all of a sudden it did it again, except the light was, like, green in color, like a bluish green, sort of like a turquoise. And then it went back to blue, and then it just shot off. Hmm. And then my mom and brother came out, and I was just like, it just, it just left. Like, it just blew off. My brother was all mad because... <laughs> right. But I was like, you know, I was telling, like, I was telling them about it and stuff, but it was intense because, like, I feel like maybe they were communicating with me. Like, I had that feeling that they were communicating with me, but maybe not just me, just maybe this the area, because, it, like I said, it wasn't like it was right across the street or anything. Right. It was still pretty far away, but it was closer. It was significantly closer than it was. Yeah, yeah, you never know. It, I mean, it could have been seen by a lot of people because I've always heard about how, <clears throat> like, if a person saw a UFO, like, hundreds of people have done seen it that don't even live nowhere near you. And, and I don't know if it's because it's so huge where they can see it even from that distance, but it travels, you know, in a, like, in a direction where everybody can see it, you know, so... It, I'm pretty sure a lot of people have. They probably just never came forward with it. And then they probably they just saw something really strange or really incredible. But, you know, if, if, it, if it hasn't hit the news, then, yeah, definitely. It, it's, it's probably yeah. just, you know. And then, again, he could have been the only one that's seen it. Because I have uh, surmised that there's a lot of situations that we go through, especially when it comes to UFOs, that they will only show themselves to certain people it may not look like it because they're just up in the sky and they're being seen by whoever you know and it's almost like like you just said that they're doing that for you you know and for nobody else that's the reason why they did they shoot off right before somebody else comes up 
because the same thing happened to me um, years ago when I was like 17. I was coming from my martial arts class, a Taekwondo class, and I happened to look up and I see this orb in the sky. Look, it was as bright as the moon, like a harvest moon, and I just and I, I said, okay, well, it's just the moon, so it wasn't no big deal. I see the moon all the time. So my mom's just driving and everything, and I, I just kept looking up, and I could tell it was huge because it, it was because you know when you look at the moon, it looks like it's following you half the time. You know, it's like it just yeah. it never stays in one spot. So it was doing the same exact thing. So I couldn't tell if it was actually following us or what because you know we was like my mom was driving. We get to my apartment, I look up, and there it was again, right over our, right over our, uh, our complex. And it, I noticed that there was two stars in behind it, one on the left and one on the right. Go inside, change out of my karate gi, and something in the back of my head said, hurry up and get outside, quick. So I run outside, and right in the exact same spot where I saw that orb just sitting there in the sky with those two stars in behind it, it was gone. I mean, there was not one sign of it. And it was a clear night. There was like not one cloud in the sky. So seconds after that, I see two bright lights hovering over my head, blinking in a certain sequence, and it was moving real slow, not making a sound. It was directly over my head. It was pretty. It was pretty low, but it was so. It was nighttime. So I, I remember I've said before in past videos that the night sky can sometimes um, reflect off of these, you know, spacecrafts. You know, to where you can't even see the shape of it let alone the size of it all you see is the lights so it's flying over my head real slow and then there was a guy coming out of the out of the um the the, um, the breezeway and something was telling me to tell the act tell him you know like you know just kind of get his attention to, to see if he actually sees it but something made me not say anything he just kept moving but i just was staring at it and i literally followed it until i couldn't follow it no more you know so yeah, that, that so it, it kind of correlates with a lot of experiences where it's almost like they are showing themselves to you and you only, even though it may not seem like it, but you know it is what it is. So, yeah, that's yeah, that's definitely that's that's pretty incredible. Now, uh, the the experience that your niece had, uh, I wanted to get into that too. Um, so, how did that happen? Like, how did that come about when it first happened? Okay, so um, my niece has always been like a, you know, like a playful kid and everything. Yeah, but um, at one point, she started. Uh, she was outside. The first time it happened, she was outside and she was playing and everything. And she pointed up. She was like pointing up at the sky and talking. Like that's how it started. She would point at the sky, start talking, and I was holding conversations like with nobody. And eventually, we asked her you know, who is it? Like, who are these people? Just being playful, just kind of asking, you know how, like, if a, we were kind of like interrogating her, but kind of like how police interrogate children, they kind of talk to them real sweet and right. get them just, you know, say things. That's how, how we were trying to, like, egg some stuff out of her. Right. And she just said that they were the purple people. Oh, purple. And, you know, and they, and I was like, how did they get down? Like, where did they come from? Like, you know, and she said, in a basketball. So, you know, we, and that being the fact that my mom's also had UFO experiences, so has my Aunt Anna, um, you know, we all kind of knew, like, or saw, we did, I'm not gonna say we knew, because I don't think nobody really knows for sure about that at all, but I know that it was abnormal and we all knew that she never had acted like that specifically before and she would talk about them for a good few i would say a couple of weeks almost a few weeks and then all of a sudden she just stopped talking about them and to this day she hasn't brought them back up but that whole time period that she was seeing them and talking to them and um she would i remember one time i followed her and she was outside and i was coming out the door and I was playing with her, and I had, because I had went in the house, I was getting something to drink, I came back out, and I was gonna, I was about to call her name and start playing, but I saw her, she was staring up at the sky and just talking, but she was pointing, which she had her whole arm extended out with her finger and everything, all the way up, and she was like pointing as high as she could, she was stretching, you know, like really trying to get her arm up there, 
and she was just talking at the same time to the sky, like just talking, holding this conversation, just like I, me and you right now. And it was so weird, you know what I mean? Like hmm. I knew like there has to be something behind this because kids, she's not, you know, crazy. And for being her age at the time, uh, I think she was about four, three or four, um, you know, she would be, she was pretty bright for that age. She, you know, was she could almost talk full sentences and everything. And, you know, for her to act like that, it was, it, it kind of scared us because we didn't know what, like, what was happening for one and for two, where was it leading, you know? Right. Because in all the, every time, you know, you ever hear about children and UFOs and stuff like that, not all the time, but sometimes the kids, you know, end up getting abducted and stuff and the parents swear up and down, you know, they were abducted, you know, and it's like, I was some, some, I guess in the back of my mind, there was a part of me that was worried maybe they would take her if it was then. Because I know that, you know, kids play and have vivid imaginations and things, but right. there's, there's that, and then there's what was happening with her, which was completely different. And even, like, my mom, my aunt, my sister, even my little brother, everybody, my, my grandfather, my grandmother, they all thought, like, we all thought that there was something else going on here. And so it was, it was really weird. And it was like, it made me think about all the times people have said that children um, are more open to and like can receive more messages than adults can because their minds are like untampered with. They're not um, dumbed down, you know, by like the educational system and the and television and working all the time and things like that wears down your mind, wears down on your other senses, you know, and... Yeah, they're pure and innocent. Yeah. Right. Children are the most pure being out there because they're, you know, like I said, they're non-corrupted. Right. So, like, I feel like something genuinely happened to her and she was actually seeing and talking to these beings, like, because I, like, and to this day, like I said, she's never brought them up again. And the weirder part is I would ask her sometimes... I would go over there, and she was uh, playing Minecraft at the time. I went over there, one specific time I went over there to play Minecraft with her. We were in the bedroom. We were both sitting on the bed, sitting back against the wall, and we were, had the controller, and we were like building stuff, and we were laughing and eating candy and everything. And I said, um, you know, hey, have you ever heard of those purple people again? And she just glared at me, and she was like, I don't talk about them anymore. Wow. And she didn't, and yeah, and, and kept playing the game, and she had an attitude for a little bit. And then, you know, she got over it eventually. We, I, you know, joked around with her a little bit, made her laugh, and she got over it. But, you know, but she really got defensive about it. Her whole demeanor changed. Like, her face, her huh. eyes, her whole posture, everything, it just changed. It was like a really adult thing, like, at, in the moment that she did, like, mm -hmm. the way she acted, you know? It's weird to describe it that way, but that's the only way I can. Like, she acted like a straight-up adult, the way she handled, like, the way she said that to me. And it caught me off guard because I was like, well, I'm sorry, okay, I won't say it. Wow. It, it, it's almost like two, two different things that I kind of picked up on. One, that maybe she experienced something that she didn't like that they were doing to her and she didn't want to talk about it because it scared her. Or they were speaking through her to keep you from asking any more questions about them, because they obviously didn't want to, they obviously didn't want to be known about, which is the reason why she just called them the purple people. Because I would think that if you tried to get information out of her, she would probably describe describe what they looked like, and she just mentioned purple people, you know, like she didn't mention like any details as far as what the eyes looked like, how big was the head, or were they wearing any clothes, you know, so. Yeah, that, I mean, I hate to say that about a child, you know, especially if it's the family member of a person that I'm talking to, but it, it just, it, that's what it sounds like, you know, and, you know, so it could be that they were maybe speaking through her just to get you to stop talking about them, and they probably knew that you was going to start trying to ask her some more questions, you know, because she was obviously in contact with them for a long period of time, and 
how they were contacting her was unknown to everyone else, including you. So maybe it was some sort of like mental telepathy or they are, you know, just were able to project their, uh, their, I guess, personality or their own thoughts into her just so that she could say what they wanted her to say. You know, but I mean, that's just an educated guess on my part. But, you know, I'm, I mean, I'm just I'm glad she's OK now and that she doesn't have, she's not having these experiences. But that, that's what it sounds yeah. like to me, you know, so. You know. Yeah, in fact, you know, she's really bright. Like she's like super smart, and like, and I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna say she's like a super genius child or anything, but like a prodigy or anything. But right. she is very smart. Like she is uncommonly smart for a child her age, and like everyone that's ever met her, even just uh, like my grandfather's friends at church and stuff, they would be talking to her, and they would be sitting there holding conversations with her, and they'd be like. You know, slapping each other in the arm, looking at each other like, look at this little girl, you know, she's, like, oh, she's talking to us. <laughs> yeah. She was really grown up. Yeah. And, like, <clears throat> I, I, my, I wonder, like, maybe did they have a hand in, like, boosting her IQ or something? Yeah, that's what I was thinking, too. Because, um, you know, when kids are just smarter than what you would think they are to be, <clears throat> it makes you wonder what could be making that happen because <clears throat> you have so many situations where, they actually just out of the blue they get smart you know or if they if however which way the parents were training them you know or whatever they learn in their environment what they pick up from that you know it's a lot different from her situation where she just out you know i won't say out of the blue but she just seemed more a lot more intelligent than a normal like four-year-old girl you know but at the same time you know, she could be just developing a lot faster than most children, you know, but it could be that too, you know. I, I would hate to say that she was a part of some experiment, you know, but, you know, maybe they were just doing that to help her along as she grew, you know. I, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, I mean, I wasn't there. I don't know her. So, yeah. like I said, that's just me yeah. thinking all like the time. Like I said, right you now. know, we, we, it's not like we got, you know, a million answers out of her, but we got... Yeah enough to know that you know it was definitely not just her imagination like something right. was going on right right well well like i said i'm just glad she's okay now and that she's not having those experiences so that that's yeah that's good you know because I, I i honestly don't i would never want a child to go through anything like that even though they may not do anything to harm her and they probably talk to her and all this stuff or any other child but Sometimes I guess with parents and family members, they don't want their child to experience what or go through what they went through when it came to that because it could get worse or it may not. I don't know, but you know you want to keep your children safe from all this stuff. You know, with, to where they won't have those same type of you know experiences or whatever. But you know sometimes you just can't control it. You know so. But yeah, okay. So now, what about um, the Bigfoot experiences? Like, uh, how did that start? Okay, um, well, it mainly took place, it took place in Alabama. Um, two of them took place in Alabama, one of them took place in Georgia. So, like, we lived in Columbus, which is, like, um, right over the bridge from Alabama. There's a bridge that connects Phoenix City, Alabama, and Columbus. And the cabin was not too far over the bridge, it was like 30 minutes, 35 minutes from my house, so we'd go up there a lot, and they, it was a lot of, you know, it was a lot of wood, it was on the water, you know what I mean, it was right on the river, so there was, you know, forest to, for miles, it was, you know, river for miles, and so we, the first thing that ever happened, this, it was the, the smallest thing, but it was like, the one of the most prominent things to me, because it was, um, it was just kind of the way it happened. It was off the wall. It was like, so we were fishing. And we were like maybe, I don't know, 20, 25 feet from the bank of the uh, beach of the river to where our boat was sitting. And it was uh, like 6.30 in the morning. It was like super early. There was fog on the water. There was no other boats. It was super duper quiet. And we were basically half asleep. And all of a sudden, there was this huge splash, like, 10 feet from our boat. And 
we kind of just came to a little bit. It scared me. I jumped and I dropped my pole. And I was like, it woke, that kind of woke him up. And he was like, well, what was that? You know, looking around. And there's like this huge ripple, like ripples coming from like this spot to the, so the boat was sitting um, uh, vertical facing the water. I mean, facing the bank. So like the front of the boat, you know, it was like going toward the bank and it was like to the top right of our, the front of our boat. And we were looking up in the trees and we didn't see anything. And then, so he turns on the little trolling motor and we kind of just start cutting down the water, like the uh, length around the beach a little bit to get away from that spot. Cause like, we just scared us, you know, it was, we, were, we felt weird, or like, we both felt uneasy, like, a different kind of, not just like a jump scare and then your, your heart's kind of beating real fast and you're, you know, you kind of get over it and you laugh it off, like, oh, that was scary. No, we were like, it actually kind of scared us. And like, we, so we went around and we were sitting there for a minute and we didn't have any weapons or anything on us or anything like that. We just had the fishing poles and a, a, a two boat paddles. So we were like sitting there and we heard a little whistle. Not like a bird chirping whistle type whistle. Like a whistle that would be from like a person whistle. But it was like really loud, but it was, it's, it's, I'm trying to describe it. It was like loud, but it was soft, almost like it was from far away, but it was loud, but it also sounded like it was closer and we thought there was somebody in there, so we kind of just left. Like, we turned the actual motor on and took off out of there. So then it was about, um, like, a month, maybe a month and a month and two weeks later, I think. And so we're sitting at the end of the driveway. The driveway slopes downward toward the cabin. It's like a, uh, almost like a, if you know what a skateboard half pipe looks like, mm-hmm. so you take like ha- half of the half pipe, it's kind of like that, it slopes up and then there's a dip to go to the top. So mm-hmm. we were sitting like up on the dip part of it at the top and we heard like a twig snap and it was like sort of loud behind us. And there was not really like any big, super big animals out there, but we thought it might've been a deer or something. So we, like we turned around to see but there was like nothing there. And I was like, okay, that was weird. And he was like, yeah. So we're sitting there talking and we're like smoking a cigarette and everything. And all of a sudden we heard like another snap, but it was a bigger snap, like a bigger branch significantly. Like it was like, like <laughs> it snapped really loud wow. and right behind us, like basically right behind us. Like I don't know how far or anything. I, cause I can never tell with these types of things. Like, cause it sounds like it's far away, but it sounds like it's right there. I can't really see anything because of the woods were like, there's a lot of little scrub oak trees and brush and like tall sort of hayish grass. So it was kind of hard to see, but I thought I saw something move, like squat down sort of, or move kind of down to the left sort of. And I was like, okay, because that second branch that broke, I know for a fact that a deer stepping on it is not going to snap it. You know, like it, it was, it sounded really big. Right. And, you know, I was cutting trees down for a living at the time, so I kind of knew, like, what it sounded like to snap different branches, like, right. if that makes any sense. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. so, like, he had a gun on him at the time. Well, 38 revolver and so he like pulled it out and he was like I ain't playing around this time and he was like if it's some weirdos or something I'm about to start shooting <laughs> I, you know this is my this is like my family's cabin he, he was going off he was getting pissed off wow. because like there was there, like about three four miles around the bins you can say um, there were some meth heads and they would they got busted a couple of times for cooking it and stuff so oh, okay. he was paired he, he was always paranoid about people stealing his stuff and so like when when he wasn't there because he he wouldn't be there for like almost a week or two at a time 
and you know the cabin only had like regular door locks on it so and there was never anybody out there so it was always like if you could say like a free picking for like a thief so he was gotten he was getting pretty heated and I was like look before you go firing off any rounds into the woods let's just make sure it's not some like neighbor kids that are like a mile up the road like walking around with guns like we used to do trying to scare people let's just make or you know just something I was like let's make sure there's not anybody out there because I'm not trying to get a murder charge or anything like that exactly. yeah. so yeah so we started walking off in there and the, every time we would take a few steps we heard a couple of like crackly leaf steps going back the other way toward where okay so like it was where we were sitting is like you could say on the right and then there's woods and then there's a road that kind of like is their driveway that leads out to the main dirt road and then there's more woods there's nothing but woods and a power line so we were like about to be on the road and we knew now that whatever was there had to have been on the road at the time because there was no more woods left for it to back up through so if it's on the road it's open it's like a big open you know dirt road right there so you can clearly see like whatever it is and we must have took I don't know 10 steps and we were there on the like on the road like on the edge of it there was nothing there we didn't see anything we didn't hear anything and I was looking on the ground to look for tracks to see if it was a deer or a hog or what didn't see anything there was no tracks not even tire tracks like it was you know pretty early there had nobody been down the street yet so I was like okay that, that's pretty weird yeah. so he so okay so I'm standing there in the middle of the dirt road he's still behind me to the back and to the right of him in the trees there was another branch break but this time it was like bigger it was it was like it sounded like somebody pushed over like a dead tree or something like a log or a stump or something okay. like a, it was a huge crackle and a crunch and it smelled like we heard it hit the ground wow. like boom it made like a stump and we he was standing there he was just frozen and he fired he turned around and he fired three shots into the woods in that direction we didn't hear anything we didn't see anything right so he was like dude there's something in here and he was getting like sweaty and he was getting pretty nervous he was getting kind of shaky I, I saw his hand shaking and I was like you know I was getting kind of shooken up because I I knew there was something there like you know it, people have you know that sense like I know if when there's something there, you know, and the and for the you know even more benefit of the doubt, I fucking hunt that area all the time with him. We know that whole this whole little area that all this stuff would happen in. He we knew it like the back of our hand, like the creeks. We knew which creek connected to which creek that went up which power line and everything. Like, it, this was not normal. This was, like, there's no way that three big branches break. Wow. Like, that, in that order. So, he kind of starts backing up. I'm like, look, let's just walk down there, and then we'll cut right back to the cabin. If we don't see anything, we'll come back. And he was like, okay. So, we sat down towards the water, and this is headed down right directly towards this little cove. So... We get down to the little muddy beach area and we're looking around, we didn't see anything. And all of a sudden my friend, I didn't see it, but my friend, he pointed at the water. He was like, whoa, and it made me jump. And I was like, what, what, what? You know, like I was freaking out. And he's like, I just saw something go under the water. Oh. And I was like, <laughs> yeah. And I was like, I was like, what'd you see? And he was like, I saw something and then like he said he scanned over the water one time from beach to beach all he saw was a little tip of like a dead log sitting there <clears throat> and it was kind of like roundish you know sticking out the water then he went back and it was he literally saw it turn around and go down 
like sort of like if like you you were looking at my side profile from like the back yeah looking sort of sideways it Mm -hmm. turned like that away and it literally went down under the water and he was he was freaked out and actually for about three or four weeks he wouldn't even go back up there (laughs) i can see why (laughs) wow that is crazy um wow (laughs) so um let me ask you a question though um now i remember you was talking about the, the branches and everything now at any time when you've been out there or at least when y'all had that experience did you see any like 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 branches or thin tree trunks that were kind of pointed downward yeah actually the the when we went back um the, like after that after he saw that he you know like i said he freaked out he wanted to leave and we left so we come back like three four weeks later and to get some stuff from the tavern. And he was like, hey man, let's go, you want to go check out that area down there and stuff? And I was like, yeah, we can walk down there for a little bit. I, I can't be here long though. He was like, okay. So we go down there and we go down to where we heard the third, the snap, the biggest one. And there was a branch on a, I think it was a, an elm tree, but it was kind of up pretty, pretty high, but it was, it stuck out. And it, but it was, it was a fresh, at the time, I guess, when it was broke, it was a fresh branch. Like, it wasn't a dead tree, if if that makes any sense. Like, it was alive. It was, you know, it was a healthy tree, so it was, it was still moist and everything. Right. Um, the branch was snapped downward, pulled that, how, like, halfway off the almost almost pulled off the tree but the branch itself like I couldn't get a tape measure up there I wanted to but we didn't have a ladder that was big enough and I couldn't find the tree but it it was uh, it had to be the branch had to be like five about five inches around so you know that's you know that's, that's a good thick branch and it was broke you know and like there was no other branches broken around it on any other trees. Sort of like you would see if a, like a bad storm would like break and blow branches down, you know? Right. It wasn't like that. This was the only branch that was broke. And it was about, I don't know, maybe 10, 10 and a half feet up. Hmm. Wow. Well, yeah, because I was asking that question because um, I, I've been, I mean, if you ever watched, um, uh, Survivor. He has Survivor Bigfoot. Uh, he has a Survivor Bigfoot edition. And the guy that he was traveling with at when it first aired, uh, he was a Bigfoot hunter, and he had some very, very, very uh, good footage of a Bigfoot, like close up, like in the face, where you can see what it really looks like compared to what they everybody thinks they look like, like or like a gorilla face or something like that. It was a completely different look but in the video it showed that the tree branch breaks are basically like kind of like a territorial mark where they break the, the the thin tree branch or the like say those real those real thin trees that have the little white uh, bark around it and it's got a little brown in the center like if it was chipped off they would break it and let it sit downward the top portion would sit on the ground like as if it's telling you this is their territory do not cross it you know, so that could be what that is, you know, if you saw it, which of course you did. And that that's them basically marking their territory, you know. So now, is this the same experience where you said a tree branch was thrown at you guys, but it no. landed in the water? No, this was, that That was the one that I, we had uh, discussed, and that was the most violent one. And it was, the, the last one for me, but it was the most violent one out of all, out of all of them, out of the, I guess, the first one was talking about uh, the splash in the water, I, you know, obviously, it, it must have thrown a rock or something, something right. heavy. Right. And, and then did the whistle, which, I don't know what the whistle's for, I, I honestly think that might be for communication to another one. Yeah, that's what I've heard, yeah. I've heard, I've heard from different theories that they don't travel alone most of the time, there's at least two, maybe three, yeah. in the area right. so my thing was 
you know, I was, I, you know, I, I thought, I, you know, I thought about that too after the fact. But anyway, the what happened was with the, the third one, it was me, my friend, and his cousin, and we were sitting around this bonfire. So his cousin goes in, and after a while, and it was me and him sitting out there. And there's from where um, I told you in the last encounter where the third big snap was. We were close to that tree where the branches broke. Um, it was sort of like right behind the cabin. We were on the direct side of it, almost at the water's edge. And we had like a, he had a fire pit there. And there's a little cove right there. And then there's another section of trees that kind of turns into a little skinny island thing and it pokes out into the water a little ways. And so we were, we had the bonfire going and it was like a really big fire. And if you, you know, anybody that's ever been out in the uh, country at night had a bonfire going, you know, like it's really dark behind the fire. You can't really see anything at the, you know, with the big flames. And we had like two big, huge uh, logs on there that were on fire at the same time. So it was a big one. And uh, all of a sudden we heard something, he, we heard something and we kind of looked over there, didn't really hear anything, and all of a sudden we heard, like, knocking, like a piece of wood hitting, a, like, a tree or a, something that was, you know, hard or something. So it was knocking. It was like, and it was happening repeatedly like that, and then it would slow down. And so then after a while, you know, it stopped. And... Uh, my friend again he thought there was somebody messing around and he was like you know he was like I got a gun like we got shotguns up here to, like let you know if you're trying to mess around you know I'm, I'll, I'll shoot into the wood like he was shouting this you know wow. and yeah he was getting pretty mad and so then we heard like a grunting sort of hmm. it was not like a not like a pig squeal because you know, like, you know I was ruling things out it was it wasn't a pig squeal and it wasn't like a big cat or like a like a mountain lion or nothing like that it was some kind of a grunt and then this like huge it was like a tree branch and it was pretty big around I gotta say it was like maybe eight to 10 inches around like it but it had been broken off of a tree I guess for a while but it he the knocking started again and my friend got really pissed off and he fired a shot into the woods with a shotgun sort of near it not at it just near it because he like you know like I said before he didn't want to shoot anybody you know the first time we definitely didn't want to shoot nobody with a shotgun no matter who it is because like and you know you know how police work but right. we he shot near it and we heard like this scream and it was this like really high pitch but guttural at the same time scream like like a manly woman scream you know like a no offense anybody manly woman right. scream right. like a high pitch with a like a roar to it like a the chesty you know guttural to it and it was really loud. And so my friend got, you know, we got scared and all of a sudden this tree branch, like huge thick, had like, it had like pieces of uh, other old sticks coming off of it, like from ages ago, you know, like sharp little ends and like knots on it. Right. It comes sailing across. And you know, the, the face of the toes is like maybe 20 or 20, five feet across give or take it came clear over the cove and hit the beach part of it was still like in the water part of it was on land it hit like right there boom and there is no and then right after that happened whatever it was he my friend got you know scared again he shot again this time he shot at it it screamed again and it ran you can hear it running through the woods, all like up towards the actual woods, that like so there is like how it pokes down to the water, going from the end of the water inland 
it goes to like a wall of this forest because it's right on the power line. So it just goes to this wall of trees. And it just, you could hear it, every, like branches breaking, things moving, leaves crunching. It ran all the way back up into the woods. And that was the last time that we had heard of it, like heard from it. And like, I've asked him recently, has he ever heard anything about it? He said, nothing's ever happened again, but that definitely was the most violent. And I had a feeling that it obviously didn't want us there, but you know, maybe it got scared because it knew we had guns now, like it has, we have weapons, so, and it doesn't. So I, all I can guess is maybe it went somewhere else but I just know that that was like the scary, one of the scariest, like probably the scariest thing that's ever happened to me. Like it was very intense. Like it was almost like the feeling if you were standing there face to face with an actual tiger, just, you know, looking at it. It's the same, even though we couldn't really see, like see anything, there was something there, you know? Right. And it was just very intense. And it, and like looking back now and then hearing about other people's encounters, um, violent encounters where like some people are camping and their RV gets shaken, like physically their whole RV is shaking or their car gets pushed over or something, you know? And I'm like, now I can relate to like, we had a whole trunk, like a tree, like it it was a tree branch, but it was basically a small tree, you know, it was huge, thrown at us from across this whole code. So, you know, Wow. If it was a, you know, if it was a Bigfoot, which I believe it was, um, it, it had to have been huge, you know, oh, yeah. but I guess this guns are, guns are one thing and throwing the treatment to another, I guess. Yeah, that's, 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 that's definitely strange because, I mean, out of all the stories I've heard about Bigfoot, the only thing they've ever actually thrown was like, like, I want to say small rocks, but like, I'd say palm-sized rocks at people but a tree or a tree trunk that's that's definitely new it may it makes you wonder what is actually true what what is actually true about what it what has been said i mean do they actually throw rocks or do they actually throw trees you know well, but, i mean i i sort of have a theory like if if you know people say that you know bigfoot have to be very intelligent like obviously they're intelligent they can sometimes they interact with people not harmlessly, like harmlessly, sometimes they interact with people like the way it happened to us. So I feel like, just like people, every Sasquatch has an individual personality. Yeah. You know, maybe they're all different. They, they got their psychopaths, they got their, you know, timid, shy, you know, Bigfoot that are never singing. And then you got ones that, you know, violently try to chase people out of their area. Maybe it was a rogue one, or maybe it didn't have a family, or who knows, like, but I just feel like, I feel like that's the case. Like, that's why some get seen, some don't. Some of the stories, I've heard of stories where, um, like, elderly women who live in, um, uh, tra- like, I, I don't remember her name, like, but it was on, uh, the story this lady was talking about on, um, this, um, YouTube video I was watching. Um, she said that it would come to her back window on a trailer. And they, she would like, it would literally put its hand like through it in the trail and she would put food in its palm and it would just walk, like walk off. All it wanted was some food. It never did anything violent, it never bothered her. She knew it was there, she knew all about it and she wasn't scared of her or nothing. And I was like thinking that maybe they know, you know, who's dangerous and who's not. Like she was the only one living there. She was a pretty old lady, so you know, she was, kind of feeble and like you know can't really do much on her own probably and it could maybe could see that and it was took advantage of her kindness like and that kind of shows their different personalities and i think what they're capable of right yeah that, that, that definitely makes uh, a lot of sense because i mean they they do show a lot of characteristics that uh, characteristics that are similar to humans i mean they also have been looked at as the missing link as well you know, but, you know, there's no, of course, there's no evidence to state that, but that has been one of the biggest theories about Bigfoot 
you know, or at least are they the missing link, you know, but it's never really been determined. <clears throat> so, yeah, that is that is definitely a very, very, very harrowing experience right there. Now, we, we got time for about maybe one ghost story. So, I wanted to top that off with maybe the creepiest one that, that may have happened to you or maybe the first one that, that ever happened to you. I mean, whichever one you want to start with first. Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, so, my uh, grandparents' house, um, the weird thing was when they first moved in, it wasn't, they never had any problems or anything. And so, um, we used to go over there, do laundry and stuff, and my grandma, one, one afternoon, came up to me and my mom, we were sitting out back, and she started telling us about how every night at about, not like directly at midnight, but somewhere, anywhere between 12 o'clock and 12.30 or so, there would all of a sudden, all the doors in their house, all at once, would start getting knocked on, all at once. Like every door in the house, even closet doors. Wow. They would just start getting knocked on really loud. And my grandpa, being a Vietnam vet and everything, would get up with his gun and walk around the perimeter of the house like three, four, five, six times. Never see anybody, there was never anybody there, the alarms, like the perimeter alarms, the windows and stuff, they were never breached or anything. So like, he was always go back to bed and everything. And after a while, they kind of got used to it. And it, But this was the first time that they were telling us about it. And so one night, um, I we were doing laundry over there and I was playing a game on the computer and I, I was like playing it for like three, four hours. I was really into it. And my mom was like, we're going home. I was like, all right, I'll just, you know, spend the night and I'll walk home in the morning. And she was like, okay. So they left and my grandparents were asleep. And so I was in the den watching TV. I got tired after a while and so I turned the TV off. And I'm laying there facing the kitchen and there, the kitchen door to the den is open. And the only light on is the little light above the stove, you know? Right. And it's kind of it's kind of bright, but it's dim. And, like, their house is already really creepy. Like, just the vibe of it is at night. Not in the daytime. In the daytime, it's beautiful. There's light everywhere. It's nice. But at night, it's so dark in there. It's just, it's really unsettling. So, like, I was laying there facing the kitchen. I had my eyes open. I was, like, messing with my phone and everything. And I looked up from my phone. Um, the cabinet doors in their kitchen have magnets on them to close, like on the cabinet, you know, like they'll close and connect to a little magnet to stay shut. Yeah, yeah. Theirs were pretty, really yeah, theirs were pretty freaking strong. You had to kind of pull it to open it. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes my grandma, because she had arthritis, she couldn't even open it. She had to get help with it and stuff. So, I, all of a sudden I'm looking at it like I'm looking at it and it literally just flew open like it just not like not flew open but it opened like wow. clearly just open like wow. off the magnet swung open halfway and stopped and this little box of like uh, cheese crackers or something I don't really remember what they were now but like some kind of crackers they fell off the shelf right in front <laughs> and I like my heart kind of dropped into my stomach that kind of feeling and like you know it, it was freaking me out so I stood up pretty quick and I turned on the light in the den and I walked into the kitchen I put the cracker back on in, in a minute and I closed the cabinet and made sure it was shut and I'm going to sit back down on the couch in there and I'm, I'm again I'm facing the kitchen going to sleep and all of a sudden I felt this that now like there's no window open the air was off and there was no ceiling fan or anything and it's actually pretty stuffy in there. and I felt like breath on my face <laughs> on my cheek like if, if something got real close to your cheek and they just said something uh -huh. like whispered something yeah. you could just kind of feel that that's what it felt like Ooh. and right not a split second after I felt that the cabinet came open again and the cheese crackers fell on the counter again 
and I was freaking out. I was just like, my heart was beating, and the thing was, like, I wasn't even scared of the fact that it was a ghost. I was, I was like pumped up. Like I, I had so much adrenaline because I knew like that couldn't happen twice like that, right. and I knew what I felt on my face. And right after my grandma had told us this that day, that's the night that I had spent the night there. And like, you know, so like, literally, it, you know, it's like, I, and then um, about, um, shoot, I don't know, like, it was like a week later, my sister was there. And it was like 7.30 at night. The light, you know, the sun's just going down, it's like pinkish purple outside. And my sister's in the bathroom. Like, we're, it was me, my mom, my brother, my sister, and my uh, Uncle Paul. We were all there in the house. Everybody else was going out somewhere. And all of a sudden, my sister screamed, like, at the top of her lungs. She comes running out the bathroom, like, halfway from her pants still. Like, I felt something touch me. Oh, boy. I was like, I was like, what? And she was like, I felt something or someone or something touch me. Like, she's at my shoulder and I'm looking, like, right in my eyes. And she was, like, crying. There was, like, a tear coming out of each eye. She was like, something touch me. And I was like, ask, calm down, calm down, sister, calm down. So, like, I go in there and I didn't see anything or anything, you know, nothing happened to me. And so then about 20 minutes later, I'm walking right back to that spot to put some towels in the old pantry thing when they next to the door. And the door was closed. It was like a wooden door with the little uh, wooden uh, slot, uh, slot things in it. You can kind of see through it. Right, yeah. One, one, of, one of the slots, and it was like in good condition and everything too. Like they weren't broken or anything. One of the slots just popped out. <laughs> wow. Like right, like outwardly towards me but on the side of me kind of like passed passed me to my left it was on my left and it like flew past like you know left past me behind and but it wasn't kicked it wasn't like not like it was kicked like it wasn't bent or broken or anything it just came out of the sitting and flew over there and there and and I, you know I picked it up it was a pretty heavy slot and you know it wasn't like, a, you know, no five pounds on it. It was like, it, it was at least a little, you know, half a pound. It was like some pretty thick wood, you know? Yeah. And I was like, I was like, there's no way. I said it out loud, too, because I, I, was, I was by myself in the room, but I was just flabbergasted. I was like, there's no way that that would do that any other way than if it was the girl. Yeah. And I, like, stood up. And I just walked out of the room, and then I told my mom, like, right when I walked out, I was like, yeah, it's definitely haunted up in here. <laughs> yeah. And they had, they had a psychic um, from California, called my Aunt Lisa lives in California, and they had a psychic, uh, one of her friends called my grandparents and, like, talked to them, and then she actually came to Georgia from California, and she flew out to do, like, a walkthrough at their house. And, and she says that there was um, uh, like a Native American woman and daughter spirit that she sensed there that died like a long time ago in the backyard. Oh. And like in this, she, but it was like a specific spot in the backyard. Like not just in the backyard. She walked over there and she was like, this is the spot. And personally, I don't completely know what to think about psychics, but she she also said some things that were very personal, like very, very personal, that only my grandfather knew, that even my grandmother didn't know about them and stuff. So I'm on the fence about it, but I'm leaning towards she was probably right because it was definitely haunted. And I mean, you know, whether or not it was Native American woman or child or just the, you know, whoever, somebody that died there, but it was definitely just a, I guess like a, maybe you could say like a prankster kind of goes, like it never hurt anybody, it just was doing all kinds of crazy stuff all the time. Right. Man, that's crazy. Yeah, God, believe me, like I said, I know exactly how you feel. I mean, I, <clears throat> in houses that I lived in since I was a kid, you would never think it would haunt it until something actually happened, you know, I mean, 
a lot of the experiences I had were small, you know, just your your basic, you know, sightings of a ghost or, you know, like disembodied noises, you know, or sounds that you hear that it sounds like somebody made the noise, but there's nobody else in the house but you, you know. But for me, things did not get crazy until like maybe probably until I was 17 and that's when I had a experience where I was used as a vessel by a ghost. I know the woman's name, first name only, but I know exactly what she looks like. I mean from head to toe, I mean the, everything, you know, and all she wanted to do was see a sunset. And after that, that was it. You know, I mean I can go into detail but that'll just take us past the, the hour which is already past that, but anyway. But yeah, but I can tell you the most the most uh, strange and scary experience I had was falling asleep on my couch and feeling someone just plop down on my side, and I could feel like brittle pad hair on my face, and I got my eyes closed. I didn't want to even try to see what it was, but then that's when I feel someone's finger circling my chest, you know, within my chest hairs, and it's like. It's not a matter of me feeling the fact that she was in that she, that whatever it was. It felt like a female finger because I could feel a fingernail, a very long fingernail going against my chest like that. But it was the fact that in the area where she was doing that, it was in the area that wasn't open as far as the buttons on my shirt. So I could tell that her finger was going through the fabric of my clothing and touching me in my chest. So that that part was really weird. And I was feeling all this when I was asleep. And I just noticed that that's where she was doing this at. You know, and it was so creepy, and the fact that she was just laying on top of me and doing this to me, and I'm like, and I just like, <gasps> like did one of them numbers, and then right after I did it, it got off of me, and it, I actually sat there for a, probably a good hour because I was just in so much shock. I've never been touched by one before. I mean, I've been used as a vessel. That's completely different from being touched by one, you know. But that that was that. Eh creepy experience for me because never been touched by one now my grandfather did that he, he was tickling me in my ribs but it was like after he passed away so that that's a whole nother story but anyway but yeah that that's that's definitely a crazy story especially when like almost the entire family is involved in in a, in a haunting like that so but yeah that is that's definitely crazy but yeah man i just i want to thank you so much for you know, um, getting a, you know, having the opportunity to talk to me and get your stories out there, and they are definitely very amazing stories, you know, or experiences rather, you know. So, Thank you. Thank you. yeah, no problem, man. You know, I really appreciate this because you know, with everything I'm trying to do, getting the truth out there, and so many people are opening up since that interview that I gave that I did uh, a couple of weeks ago. It's really opening up a lot of floodgates with a lot of people who have experiences, whether it be a national park or just personal paranormal experiences, you know, and like I said before, parano the word paranormal has so many different levels to it. It's not just about people who disappear in national parks. It's everything that happens to you that can't really be explained by a logical reason, you know, so and you, you know, everyone else, you and anybody else that may ha have these experiences, you know, I, I, I'm just, I'm thanking you guys for, you know, getting your stories out there and sharing it with the world so they can know that you're not alone and everybody has these kind of experiences so but without further ado everyone i want to thank you guys for coming out to listen to this video and i will definitely see you guys once again with another harrowing story and this one is the next story is going to be about or the next case is going to be about a young female that that dis that went missing went missing last month i'm going to be doing a video on that probably later on tonight or tomorrow so have no fear i will have another you know a major story it's, i, I got to get into the details because i'm not sure exactly what happened to her but i do know that the parents are just distraught from what happened and the people on this forum that i'm a part of was saying they want people to share it so we can get the word out there so i told her i'll put it on my channel and hopefully that'll help make you know get get awareness out there because she's 18 years old and she's been missing ever since after she was supposed to been going to see a friend and she never made it so it almost kind of sounds like the the missing 411 cases where she told them where she was going but before she got there she disappeared 
So, and they said all she had with her was her pocketbook, her keys, and her phone, I believe. And the phone was turned off. So, it makes you think that maybe either her phone, the energy from her phone was drained or someone turned it off. You know, it could be anything. So, I will get into that and I will definitely have that video up for you either tonight or tomorrow. So, stay tuned. Keep your eyes locked on my channel and I will definitely have that for you. So, you guys know how I do it. At the very end, aloha, mahalo, and ahuyo. Peace out.